Hey, so uh, we're here in this uh, Iranian-owned restaurant called Banu in Toronto's West End. Uh, I'm Andrew Chang, by the way. Hello. Uh, this is about that, the show where we're all about explaining and expanding on the news. And I'm here sipping this classic Persian tea, a chai. And we're here, uh, in case you haven't guessed already, to talk about Iran and the ongoing protests there. Although, maybe at this point, it feels more appropriate to call it a revolution. Masa Amini was arrested in Iran in September, taken into police custody, and died in police custody, the so-called morality police there. A force which, by the way, had caused quite a stir, especially in Western media, after Iran claimed that it had dismantled the force, although those claims seem pretty specious, and I don't know of a whole lot of people who believe a single word of it. Amini's crime was exposing too much hair and wearing jeans that were too tight. Her death has sparked a revolution, the likes of which we have not seen maybe in 40 plus years. And at first, the demand was for a mandatory end to the wearing of the hijab. But that has transformed into a demand for the downfall of an entire regime. I mean, just look at this. Open, brazen defiance, risking being arrested, beaten, or worse than that. And all of that in the face of, in spite of, a brutal, bloody crackdown by Iran's security forces. And what should give you pause when you watch a video like this is just how young these protesters are. Most of them just teenagers, willing to risk everything, put everything on the line, to see nothing less than a complete transformation of the country they live in. There are some that say this generation, Iran's Gen Z, poses the boldest challenge to Iran's theocracy that we have seen in decades. Okay, so our guests have just arrived. Uh, both Iranian, both human rights activists. Uh, Kaveh Shahruz is also a lawyer and Nazanin Samavati is, uh, recently organized a protest uh, in defense of human rights, in support of women and girls in Iran. And I have lots of questions to ask, so let's get right to it. Kaveh, Nazanin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for your interest in this story. No, well, absolutely. I, I mean, can, can you help paint the picture for us? So what is it that these protesters have at stake and, and the lengths to which they are willing to go to change the world, effectively. They're doing this for life. It's about for, for environment, for having uh, a normal life, for uh, being able to kiss mm. without fear. But you say they're, they're fighting for life, and yet yeah. they, they're risking their yeah. lives. It's the irony of the situation, yeah. They're risking their lives because they know that if they don't, they won't have a normal life. Their life has been one of utter hopelessness, right? They're born in a country where they can't do the most basic things that you and I do in Canada. They can't dance, they can't sing um, as women. Uh, they have good educations, but they have no hope for the future. Um, and because they can't get jobs, because the economy is in shambles, because of mismanagement and corruption and sanctions and all of that, they can't start families. Um, all the things that you and I take for granted in, in, in terms of what makes a good and um, you know, fruitful life, all those things are taken away from them. I mean, you talk about a chance for a normal life. They're so young, yeah. the protesters. Like, it's staggering to see, right? That just teenagers. These teenagers have a lot of knowledge about the life at home. They have access to internet. They see other people. They are TikTok generations. So they see uh, other kids around the world. They see how normal life is and they, they want the same. I hear the words that you're saying and yet here I am sitting here. I'm, I'm still trying to process in my head how a 14-year-old yeah. could look at their life as it stands today and think, I'm willing 
to put it all on the line, to change it. How, just how, how bad things must have to be. Some years ago, um, a, a woman that I know well, actually I think Nazanin knows her well too, um, her name is Roya Hakakyan. She wrote a book called Journey from the Land of No. And I think that phrase is one that really speaks to me. It's the land of no. Imagine you're, you know, you say 14 year old. As a 14 year old, your life has just been constantly being told no. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't look to the future. You can't, as I mentioned, you can't sing, you can't dance. At some point it sinks in, like I, you know, I have to take a shot here at possibly getting to yes, because otherwise this cannot be my life. And I think what you also see among young people today is that they are not um, bound by the, by the old sort of ossified uh, ideologies of their parents, right? They just, they, you know, the older generation was maybe tied up in these anti-imperialist fights or Marxism and this and that. All that is gone. All they want is just, you know, the freedoms that you and I in the West have. That's what they're fighting for. And these are the fourth generation after the revolution. So their parents are my generation. Mm -hmm. Like these are, and the parents have been through that and they try to teach them that that's not the way of life. Right. And they give them more freedom at home. So they 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 have the tr they have seen what the real life is mm -hmm. through their families through the uh, through internet and as Kava said uh, through uh, relatives abroad. A lot of people thought that they could work within the system, right? So the previous generation fought for reforming the Islamic Republic. In two thousand nine, they went on the streets and their their battle cry was, "Where's my vote?" Right? They still thought, even though elections are controlled, even though it's not a free and fair election, they could use the, lever, the existing levers of power um, to, to change the system for the better. This generation has realized that that was an utter failure. Um, the, the regime is incredibly brutal, even in dealing with reformists. Um, and also those reformists sold them a bill of goods. Those reformists never really were committed to changing the system fundamentally. And so this younger generation, um, sees no way forward except to get rid of the system entirely and they have lost the fear. I mean, you see it in all the videos that come out. You know, dictatorships have two primary tools. One is guns and the other derived from guns is fear. Once the currency of fear loses its, its value, it's game over for dictatorship and that's kind of what you're seeing in the streets today. Right. What's your sense of why now? Why does this protest seem to have so much momentum now? It's been boiling for a while. Reformist, so-called reformist faction of the regime uh, tried to deceive people. They made uh, the idea of revolution as something uh, catastrophic. Revolution means that you see what happened after the 1979 revolution. If you go towards that path again, right. something worse than this happened. So they try to tamper down uh, any, any dissent. Mm -hmm. But this generation, it was that the, they break away from all these ideas because they saw the true nature of the uh, Islamic Republic. Right. And they, they are not being deceived. They are very smart. And, and when we think of the, the spark for these most recent protests, I just think that, you know, unfortunately, we have seen protesters die in police custody before, right? We've, we've seen protests and, and grievances over the economy before, over elections before. And, and I'm, I'm still find myself trying to, to understand what is so fundamentally different now about this moment in time, what it is that has captured the imagination of this generation. I would actually date it back a little bit further to the shoot down of PS752, um, mm -hmm. the, the Ukrainian national flight. Um, and the reason I, I say that is because up until then, a lot of the horrific things that the Iranian regime had done had been directed at people that had certain political leanings, right? They went after royalists, they went after leftists or liberals and this and that. And, and people thought to themselves, we could keep our heads down, maybe, and like live within the system. When that plane got shot down, I think it was, it was just a stark reminder to everybody that nobody's life is safe, right? Like these people that were on the plane, we're not political, they just got on a plane. It could have been anybody, it could have been anybody's child. And I think it's the same thing with the Masa Amini killing, is this woman could have been anybody's daughter, right? It could have been anybody's sister. And I think the feeling was, this was a reminder of the daily indignity and the daily risk of living under this theocratic dictatorship. And that's kind of the, the thing that set off these protests. And now they're chanting, death to the dictator. Yeah.
I mean, they're, they're looking for regime change. I mean, they, they yeah. mean those, those words. Yeah. Yes. Protesters have, have had to overcome not just the, the brutality of security forces, but through the filming of what they're doing. I mean, taking video is, is dangerous, mm -hmm. right? They have to be, be mindful of technology, them using it as a weapon, but being used as a weapon against them. This is war against an incredibly brutal enemy. One side has camera phones and the other has guns. And they also have ways of you know, doing surveillance on the use of those phones and, and so on and so forth. So it's a very unequal battle. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here because um, technologically that's sort of an interesting point, right? A and I wanna pull things over to a different conversation that I'm about to have here with Masa Ali Mardani. Uh, Masa, you are a, a senior researcher with Article 19, that's a human rights organization, and you're also an internet scholar with the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, you're joining us from Oxford. Can you sort of help us understand the, I don't know, the, the information landscape in Iran, just what that looks like? So they have complete control over internet service providers. So no internet service provider really can exist within Iran without cooperating and feeding in directly to um, cent the centralized control of the state. So in order to get licenses, internet service providers need to incorporate, you know, censorship and surveillance technologies. And so um, there has always been uh, this kind of element of inbuilt censorship and control with all the access to the internet. It was particularly concerning during November 2019, the last time we saw a national uprising the way that we're seeing in Iran right now. So during November 2019, we saw a kind of week-long nationwide internet shutdown where access to the international internet was stopped. Um, and this happened... It didn't happen necessarily through a kill switch, but it happened through orders that were given to these various different internet service providers across the country to shut off access for their users. And I've also heard of, of mobile curfews. What are those? During the first two months, immediately after Gina Massanini was murdered, we started seeing patterns of mobile curfews. So between 4 p.m. and 1 a.m., uh, mobile internet was disconnected for most Iranians across most major internet service providers. And of course, 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. is the time that most protests happen on the streets. And of course, most Iranians are connecting to the internet through mobile connections. They also were attacking circumvention tools because you know so many different internet services are blocked. So you need a VPN to connect to Facebook or Twitter or Telegram. Um, and so we saw this, you know, very concerted and sophisticated attack to disable various circumvention tools um, since the beginning of this uprising. And on top of this, when, you know, circumvention tools are disabled, Iranians are very savvy. For the past, you know, decade, it's been a cat and mouse game between the state and Internet users to find ways around censorship. And so, you know, when one VPN is disabled, Iranians usually have like 10 or 20 other kind of applications to turn to, to see which one will work. Let me play you a video first, because we are seeing video come out of Iran of protesters. Uh, let's play this right now here. <laughs> So Massa, I, I mean, the, the video speaks for itself, but the fact that it is so heavily blurred, I mean, that's, that's intentional, right? They go through great pains to ensure that the images are blurred and, you know, people can be as anonymized as possible to ensure there isn't, you know, any further repression for being caught in these videos. Um, another thing about that video, um, so that's uh, a film that was taken in the city of Rasht in the north of Iran. Um, I believe it was from uh, November. And so like 15 minutes after that video was filmed, uh, that crowd was attacked by security forces who rain tear gas and rubber pellets um, against the people in that crowd. And so that that scene did not last very long. Hmm. Um, there's one more video that I'd like to show you, Massa. Take a look at this. <laughs> and, 
I mean, it's a, just a short clip, but Masa, I mean, you, you spoke about the incredible amount of risk that the protesters themselves face for taking part in such demonstrations. I also wonder about the risk to the people who are doing the filming, who are then disseminating and spreading videos such as that. I mean, that, that must also be pretty risky business. Yeah, I mean, we have seen evidence of security forces um, targeting uh, folks with their phones out and filming this footage. We've seen, you know, in schools, um, police forces come to the schools and one by one check the phones of students to ensure there isn't content like this. We've even been seeing some cases in the courts, some of them that are, you know, execution cases where, you know, the evidence of videos being found on the accused phones is being used to basically criminalize them. There are a number of protesters who have said they leave the house without their phones. Um, I mean, there is an element of surveillance that the state also has with phone technology, which is, you know, SIM cards can sometimes be traced, especially if, you know, your SIM card is registered with the state, which is a very common thing in Iran. So there is a lot of, you know, risk when taking out devices like this in Iran. Um, and obviously then there's a risk of if you go out with a dummy phone and you're caught by security forces, you might be, you know, incriminating yourself or facing further harassment for looking like you're trying to hide something. So there's different elements to obviously just beyond finding the right internet connection and trying to get this content out. People are actually risking their lives to get this content out. Masa Ali Mardani, thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. Thank you. What is it that you think Canadians should take notice of? I see Islamic Republic as, a, as an organized crime network that has a state running. Mm -hmm. this, this is, so as long as we, are, we don't deal with drug cartels as normal people, drug cartels, drug lords, we don't deal with them as normal people. They are not. Mm -hmm. We don't give them seat at the UN, at the UN. But Islamic Republic has all of this. And as long as they are in power, nobody's safe. I would like to see these protests continue, obviously. Despite the risks, I think they will continue because I think the, the Iranian people are incredibly fed up with this dictatorship. What I'd like to see is the Iranian regime isolated completely diplomatically. Um, so, for example, they, they sit on the UN Women's Rights Commission, which is shocking to me, you know, can you imagine? Um, there is going to be a vote in a, in a week or two to hopefully kick them off, off of that seat. There ought to be more and more isolation of this regime being told that it's not a normal state, as, as Nazani was saying. I mean, this is, a, this is a crime syndicate posing as a, as a legitimate state. It is not a legitimate state. You must be worried, though, about retaliation. That as protesters continue to build steam, of course. that security forces will crack down yep. even harder. Yep. Yeah, I am, I am certainly worried about that. But I, I think, first of all, the, the people themselves have shown that they are willing to take these risks um, at immense personal courage. And secondly, I think what I hope to see from opposition leaders, both inside and outside the country, is calls less for kind of violent conf confrontation with the system and more acts of civil disobedience in such a way that it makes it difficult for the regime to kind of retaliate with the full brutality that it's capable of. Or sabotaging the system. Yeah. that they they are paralyzed yeah they right. cannot function that's that's in the way they I mean, that's these are the ways can i ask you what what keeps you up at night as you continue to watch these protests these kids and their safety i am worried about them it's, it breaks my heart every time that i see a video of a protester being shot at or getting killed so uh, I am hopeful, yet extremely worried. Does this get worse before it gets better? Regrettably, I think so. Um, but it will depend, in my view, a lot on how the opposition plays its hand. If the opposition moves towards more violent confrontation with the system, I think it will get very, very bloody. And I think the regime would welcome that. They actually want a violent confrontation. But I, I suspect that if the opposition, as I mentioned, moves towards civil disobedience, if the opposition starts putting out signals um, to members of the security forces that they might be given amnesty if they put their weapons down and refuse to follow orders, 
I think there might be a shot at uh, you know getting to a better place with minimal bloodshed. Well, and can I ask you this question? Will the regime fall? I have no doubt that it will. Really? No doubt. Why do you say that? Just a few minutes ago, I told you that the currency that dictatorships rely on is fear. That fear is gone. It's impossible for the regime to get that back. You have 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds going on the streets yeah. and you know, chasing down the principal at their school who's been an, a regime enforcer. There's no way you're going to be able to put that child back to you know, fearing this regime. They're, they're, they want freedom and they've made it very clear. University students, today was the uh, day is called uh, the, the student day for university students. And one of the people from the government went to Sharif University and a girl came up to the podium, started uh, without a job. She moved through her job in front of him and confronted him. They are fearless. Yeah. I am a graduate of the same university. And I can never imagine seeing myself being up there talking like that. Right. So the fear is gone. I am hopeful as the same for the same reason. Thank you to both of you for this. Thanks so much. Thank you. Does this get worse before it gets better? If the opposition moves towards more violent confrontation with the system, I think it will get very, very bloody. And I think the regime would welcome that. They actually want a violent confrontation. Hey, welcome back. Um, we replayed that clip from Kave because I was really struck by what he said. Because, you know, we always, in any crisis, we want to know whether things are kind of going like this or whether they're going like this. And as if to answer that question, late last week we had a major development where Iranian state media reported for the first time since these protests began back in September that the country had executed its first protester. They say Mohsen Shikari was sentenced to death in October by hanging for injuring a paramilitary officer, and that execution was just recently carried out. And then today, we got word of a second execution. Majid Raza Ranavard, just 23 years old. Again, another protester. Now, this is all notable because this is effectively the Iranian regime telling not just its own people, telling the world that these are just the first executions. Will there be others? But I suspect the, the reality of it is much sadder than that because, I mean, in, in a more important way, these aren't the first deaths, are there? Are they? I mean, you know, how many people have we seen killed, protesters, in police custody? How many protesters have been killed in the street? The UN says hundreds, uh, dozens of children. Things are already pretty bad on the ground in Iran. We'll keep watching. Thanks for joining us here on About That. Take care.